Continuing here. Well, I'm still in love. Lauren, if you happen to be listening, please say hi to Joe. And um, I hope you're uh, enjoying your little life like I am. I've got a great life I'm very grateful for. And, you know, we should all be very grateful. Like I say, blessings that aren't counted are blessings missed. And every day we've all got so many things to be grateful for. All those little things, you know, just simple little things. Like that plate of food that you almost, that you just prepared and you almost knocked off the counter, but you didn't. Do we think to thank God for the, all those little things throughout our day and just all the ways that we're rich in the good, tangible, sound, godly ways? And are having right values and, you know, are, are we grateful that we have a conscience and valuing all those things we wouldn't do for any amount of money. You know, we should cherish those. Those are godly values that we should all cherish. Just, just thank God for putting that in you, your heart and your mind and your spirit and your soul. Okay, that's the soul we're talking about. That's a beautiful thing. And we need, again, we got that from God. We should be just grateful every day that we're good, decent, upright human beings. But we don't, you know, we want to make sure that we, we, we teach other people about these things too so that they can turn their focus from the way the world is always trying to malfocus us, I would say, is, the, you know, the way it is, is, you know, focus on <laughs> what they call common sense, worldly, secular values. And don't focus on those ethereal, uh, existential, esoteric kind of things, right? But really, we should. We should really think long and hard about things like values. I mean, you know, this idea that death is bad. I mean, anybody in the right mind would agree death is always bad. It's just, you know, what we, some would argue, oh, well, they were in pain and, you know, they're better off dead and live and let die and all that. But at the end of the day, the truth is, if you really love life and, and value life and your existence, you're really grateful for it and think, believing that God's not an a-hole and he doesn't give these great things like life to us and then take them away. He gives us this great opportunity to live forever and it just gets better and better and better instead of feeling like we're just stuck on this merry-go-round that's going nowhere except to hell on a rocket okay this crap hole that we call reality but that it's going to get better and better and better that the good guys eventually ultimately are going to win this fight and that's what it's all about and this offer of eternal life in paradise a body that can't be threatened by anything no diseases no harm can come to it is a beautiful thing. That's good news. You see, this is a big part of the why the Bible is called the gospel, because gospel is translated good news. That's good news for all of us, knowing that God loves you so much that he would die for you. I mean, we think it's so great when another human being would die for you, and then there's a lot of those, and it is great. It's wonderful. And they got that from God, though. That's a godly characteristic. Okay, that somebody loves you more than their own life and they would give their lives for you. That's awesome. Who can say it isn't? That's a beautiful thing. But they got it from God. And God, being your very owner, proved that he would lay it on the line. Jesus Christ did not have to die on the cross for us. Okay, but he did. He didn't want to. It's very clearly written how Jesus really tried to talk it over with the Father and, and see if there was another way around. Because, I mean, who in the hell in the right mind, semi in their right mind, a little bit in their right mind, would want to die the way he did, okay? Beaten, spit on, some say his beard was pulled out by hand. Could you imagine how bad that would feel, any of you guys with a beard? Okay? And then be struck, punched, beaten, whipped. And then to be hung up on a cross, nailed to a cross through your hands and feet. How effed up is that? But that's what God had to do. This had to happen to prove to us once and for all his love. And then to prove his power over death. Do you understand? That's a big deal. That God has the last say. Victory over death is what the offer is. Eternal life is not in a crap hole, but in a paradise that keeps getting better and better and better forever because it can't be stagnant. It's never going to be boring. We're going to be growing and evolving and learning and experiencing new things 
for all eternity. It's going to be exciting and exhilarating and fun and free. And that's it. Like, we're God's kids. What does he want for us? What's logical? What does any even crappy parent want for their kids, right? Of course they want the best. They want them to be happy and free. That's it, right? It's definitely secure and... Uh, they don't want any harm to come to them in any way. No pain, and certainly no death. So Jesus did not want to do what he did for us, but he did it. He was willing to. He loved us that much. And the father gave him an out. He said, you don't have to do it, but if you want to save these people from their sin, then this is what's required. But Jesus could have at that point decided to forsake us. And it's written that Jesus said to, you know, Peter, after he cut the ear off the, the guard that was taking him into custody to be crucified, uh, he said, don't do that. He said, don't you understand? I could have what 12 legions of angels, God knows what number that is, at my side to save me from the cross right now. And I believe that. I firmly believe that God, I mean, this is a God that, remember, set up the universe and the galaxies and the solar systems and the flora and the fauna and all the design and the life. I mean, it's something to do, right? I mean, so if you were God Almighty, you're sitting there, well, he's having fun. He's creating. He's doing stuff. I mean, it, it, that's one of my favorite hobbies. I'd love to think, dream, and just like, wow, how could I improve this thing? What's bugging me here? How come there's no solution? Well, you know, look out there on the marketplace. Hey, I could maybe have a good idea here. It's an original idea, and it's something pretty simple. But nevertheless, it's like, wow, yeah, people would appreciate having that on the market. And, you know, I could see that thing selling. But, I mean, it's fun. You know, then you draw it on a piece of paper and sketch it out. And it's a beautiful thing. It's it's a God-given characteristic. So we understand inherently we're made in the image and likeness of God, why he does everything he does. Okay, so... As much as we need to know about the Father, God Almighty, the Creator God, male, male and female, refer to the Father. I mean, this whole idea of you know God being male, it's just not true. But we do refer to the Heavenly Father. We refer to the Earthly Mother, right? The Mother Earth is the feminine side. I mean, why do we think of pink as being a feminine color? Well, you know, pink, we know the door of life is generally of that tone. Blue, why Why are men, you know, blue? Well, the Heavenly Father is in the sky. The sky is blue, perhaps. I'm just saying it, it's an interesting thing, the male-female dynamics of the Creator and how He made it this way. It's, it's, it's obvious. I mean, but, you know, is one more important than the other? I mean, they work in concert together, in conjunction with each other, the male and female of God. But Jesus said, listen, you know what? God loves you. He loves all of us. And we can go directly to the Father. So Jesus never said that we need to go through him. But nevertheless, if you want to learn about the character and nature of God, you can learn everything you need to learn through him and what he taught, which is a big deal. I mean, it's a huge departure from common thinking in secular society, the worldly society. I mean, we get into the values and all this stuff. I mean, it, it's a big deal to know that, you know, God is totally one way and we are totally another. And unless we make a conscious effort, a concerted effort, a deliberate effort not to be evil and to be taken in and corrupted by the ways of this world so our hearts and minds and spirits and souls are corrupted and we don't know it. But, hey, if you got to weigh it out, we're going to end up our values weren't good enough to be found worthy and deserving of inheriting a better world. And that's something I don't want to fall into. And I'm concerned about that every day. But this fear of the Lord, I mean, this whole idea of, is about direction. It's about guidance. It's about a program of attraction, not coercion. That's the character and nature of God. He wants us to love us because we love him. He's worthy of our love. And that of our own free choice, our own free will and accord. And that's the relationship, and it's a beautiful relationship. I want to live forever, and not in this crap hole. I get the whole live and let die thing, believe me. I mean, it's a pain in the behind sometimes dealing with it. I mean, it just makes me feel like I just want to go on mental disability or something, just coping and contending with just the nonsensical nature 
of my so-called reality. It's just all about money. I mean, what is what what is going on here? Okay, having to incur bills and pay bills and see things just getting worse and worse and worse and not knowing how these how things are going to wind up. Seeing this wealth imbalance continue to grow. I mean, that's a big deal. Where does it stop? Where does it end? Do, am I the only one asking these things? I mean, how scary is it? How, how effed up is it going to get before they turn around? And just think of those demons that are going to just rebel against this idea that it could ever turn around. I mean, how dare you suggest that your currency could ever begin to be worth more and that we start drying up homelessness and desperate poverty and crime starts going down as a result and the dubious wars are harder to get started and the social welfare industrial complex begins to wane and become uh, irrelevant and the same with the financial institutions the financial uh, all the financial services uh, institutions out there and this the debt begins to go into decline how dare you suggest that could ever happen or that that would be a good thing you, you, you get what I'm saying here so we're in a lot of trouble we're in dire straits okay we need God's help if there's any hope at all I mean, I, when I see things going like this, I think, well, you know, by the looks of it, just looking empirically at the evidence, observing, it just looks like the bad guys won, the evildoers, and uh, they're just going to murder all the good guys. But then what do they have? Then they're they're stuck with each other. And you, you, you understand these people, they can't be pacified. They're insatiable. They don't even, themselves are insane. They're madmen. So they don't know what they even want. They, they don't know what the end game is. They don't care about God or conscience. What can these people know? If they don't care, if they've got no, no reverence for God, no respect for God and what his will is, or by that for that matter, human beings far less by extension, right? They just don't care. They, they're better than, they're more deserving and worthy, more blessed. They're, they're, they don't value stupid things like conscience and integrity and soul. No, those are for the chumps to value those stupid values. They're... Uh, uh, they're insubs unsubstantial. They're untangible. They're not concrete. Okay, so therefore they're not real in their estimation. They just don't care. They're irre those are irrelevant values to those that are perishing. And they need parenting. But they're not going to accept it, are they? And it's our job to parent them. The good guys, the righteous people. To, to speak truth to power in every way, any way you can. Speak truth to anybody that'll listen. But know this, that God is consistent, okay? That good has a definition, and God is wholly good. He's not responsible for anything bad that's ever happened to humanity throughout history, neither organically or inorganically. You can't call the fall of man God's fault. He instructed us. He directed us. He was giving us guidance and counsel and said, don't eat from that, damn, that one tree. That's all I'm asking. Anything else is fine, okay? But we did, and everything got corrupted, okay? The first question you ask is, how do you know you're naked? Who told you that? And that we got money. These two things that make us very distinct from other creatures, the fall of man, the subsequent curse of the earth. There's something very wrong with this picture. We're screwed up from birth because of this. We're steeped in sin from birth. We're born into sin. Our parents are ashamed of their nakedness. We're brought up to be ashamed of our nakedness. Unlike any other creature on the world. And do we ask why that is? But we all do it. I, I'm a modest guy. I, you know, you're not going to find me naked anywhere you don't expect to. But the money thing, do we understand? This also distinguishes us from every other creature. We're under this curse. That we succumb to this and it, it just it just screws up every aspect of our lives. None of us can really know reality. How can we? We're enchained. We're in chains. We're enslaved from birth to the money masters of misery. We got to pay them their dues, their cost of living. And it is not the way God would have it. We can solve all of our problems. If we use our God-given imagination, our power to think it through, every single problem.
So if I've convinced people that indeed they are being tyrannized, and I have pointed out how they're being tyrannized, and how and who exactly is tyrannizing them, who the kingpins are, the masterminds, these grand puppeteers, the uh, that's the top politicians in concert with their lapdogs for the money printing class.